Hello and welcome back once again to the massive YouTube iceberg. Today we'll be continuing on with tier 8, the degenerate tier. The first couple tiers in this video were meant to be a part of the first part, but I wanted to spread out the length of the tier. So if some entries have info that's a bit outdated, that's probably why. Also another thing I'd like to clarify, I wasn't the person who created the iceberg that was potted plant. He made the whole chart back in 2021. It's for that reason that nothing on this iceberg will be newer than that time frame. So nothing from 2022, 2023, or 2024. Since I'm getting this question a lot in the comment section, I'd like to reiterate that I am open to suggestions from you guys. When I finish up the whole thing, I'm most likely planning on making a YouTube iceberg bonus video or the lost entries or honorable mentions or some title like that. So this is me actively encouraging you guys to suggest things for that in the comment section. And you can do that on pretty much every video. I read basically every comment I get. I won't add every entry because some things people suggest either are on the iceberg already or um dumb. Pretty sure someone's asked me to add themselves to the iceberg. I'm uh I'm not I'm not doing that. However, if a suggestion is interesting enough, I will probably add it, and I'll even most likely credit the commenter who suggested it, so long as I don't forget. Anyways, with all that yapping out of the way, let's get right back into it. Mr. Tinfoil Man, sometimes just known as Mr. Tinfoil, is a strange YouTuber who joined in 2009. His earlier videos consist of him doing strange voices and putting on weird filters, resulting in quality content like hungry, hungry hippos. Man, I hate fast food. It's worth noting, though, that this wasn't his first channel. Mr. Crackhead 2009 is actually where our story starts with this guy. All of his videos on this channel center around himself, rambling incoherently in his room while wearing a trash bag around his body. He also, notably, does not have any teeth. Just thought that seemed like a significant thing to point out. Anyway, in 2012, he uploaded a video called Sammy the Real Story, where essentially he admits that the whole thing was all the character he was playing, and he's not actually a crackhead or schizophrenic or anything you might glean from these videos. And he has teeth. However, the character, which he called Sammy, wasn't exactly retired, as on his new channel, Mr. Tinfoil Man, he would continue uploading these videos and sometimes pretending to be a baby. He really got his big break, though, in 2016, when he began making videos addressed to certain popular YouTubers at the time, like FooseyTube, Pyrocynical, and most notably, Leafy is here. This video right here is what you might know him for. Hi, Leafy. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm so excited to make this video. I myself was never an avid Leafy watcher, but for some reason I definitely remember seeing him freak out in reaction to this video. 2016 YouTube was a different time, I guess. Ekvanet is an art project slash ARG created by Troy Wagner, who you may know from his other, more popular work, Marble Hornets. The series is a spin-off that takes place in the same universe, and just like Marble Hornets, the plot is pretty complicated and requires a full in-depth analysis to understand what's even going on. You know, I was kind of happy that Marble Hornets didn't have its own entry, not because I didn't like it or anything, I actually have quite a bit of respect for it, it's just, it's really complicated. Doing as basic of an overview as I can, Ekvanet follows a person who goes by S. Hawkins as they investigate mysterious broadcasts coming from a long since defunct television network known as, well, Ekva. The story goes that a mysterious individual known as the Broadcaster hijacked the airwaves in order to specifically target S. Hawkins. The actual videos themselves are pretty multimedia, factoring in some live action, some animation, and even some classic emergency alert system type stuff. You know, the ones with uh, that font. Yeah. If you want more info on the series, there's a Nightmind video for you to watch, and also a 40301 video too, which is a lot more recent. This video is footage of the aftermath of a plane crash in the woods near the city of Smolensk, Russia. The crash happened on April 10th, 2010, and was actually an airplane operated by the Polish Air Force. I'm surprised I've never heard of this before, but apparently all 96 occupants died without a single survivor. Those who passed included the fucking president of Poland, his wife, the former president in exile, which I didn't even know was a thing, several senior Polish military officers and government officials, the president of the National Bank of Poland, 18 members of the Polish parliament, and family members of the Soviet-era cotton massacre. Yeah, I would have thought more people would talk about this given such a large chunk of the country's government fucking died in a single plane crash, but surprisingly this is the first time I've ever heard about it. This video in particular actually seems to be the subject of conspiracy theories. In the video, you can very clearly hear what seems to be gunshots. 
This has led to conspiracy theories that the plane crash was actually an act of assassination, orchestrated by the Russian government. As in, the plane malfunctioning was done by some Russian meddling, and then the snipers came out and finished the survivors off. Now, delving into whether or not that's true is a whole conspiracy theory thing that my dumbass doesn't feel well equipped enough to make an informed opinion on. Some people, including even world leaders, believe it, while others think it's a major stretch. No matter the case, this video is definitely real. I mean, you can see the plane right there. It's on fire and split into pieces. No matter what, this video definitely has a disturbing atmosphere. Harahara Ochamoto's Dancing is a video that doesn't actually exist on YouTube anymore as it was taken down for violating YouTube policy on nudity or sexual content. So I'm not actually going to show you the video here, but I will show some screenshots. This video finally takes us back to the great website of Nico Nico Dogo. Set to an HP Lovecraft themed parody of Carol of the Bells, I don't really know how to describe what goes on in this video, at least at first glance. There's this weird face edited to be in a BDSM outfit and uh, pregnant, and there's also this moon with a face that's crashing into Earth, and well, whatever's going on here. Yeah, I couldn't find the uncensored version, and I don't really have any plans to. Apparently, this is part of a Nico Nico Doga trend called Air Moto, which was popular in the late 2000s and consists of edits of this promotional interview with Masami Hisamoto. She's part of a religious organization called Soka Gakai International, which, according to Know Your Meme, people kind of regard in a similar way that Americans would regard Scientology. As a result, people would make tons of edits poking fun at this organization, and I guess Ochimoto's dancing was that taken to its natural extreme. The Peanut Vendor is an experimental animation created in 1933 by New Zealand filmmaker Len Lai. It features this monkey character singing about how he's a, you know, peanut vendor. It's one of the first stop-motion animations ever, and is ridiculously impressive for the time period. However, this is another case of old films having that uncanny valley effect to them, where since they're just getting started, it kind of looks real, but still strange enough to be off-putting. Still, again, it's very impressive. The Poop Shitters is a channel created in 2019, and according to its channel description, is the best band ever. Every single one of their videos, along with their icon and banner, is this image of five compressed, hyper-realistic sansas, with the text The Poop Shitters laid on top of it. Over the years, The Poop Shitters have released genre-defining hits, such as Album 1, Song 1, <laughs> Album 1, Song 2, Album 11, Song 1, and Album 6, Song 4. Describing themselves as an American post-punk new metal hip-hop band from California, their songs are almost all literally just middies of Undertale, Deltarune, or other popular songs as middies, and compressed to be the lowest quality possible. Part of me thinks that they just swap out some instruments for fart sound effects, but I think the trumpet is just really bad. Apparently, this channel is actually the origin of this image, which I didn't know. Like, I've already seen this image before, but I thought it was just someone made it for no reason. Which, I honestly think is kind of funnier, but whatever. So, this entry was originally called Creepy Russian Videos, with creepy being in air quotes, but Potted Plant specifically messaged me, telling me to change the name to Russian Death Files, as that's a more accurate term for what he was referring to. The Russian Death Files are a set of mostly videos, though sometimes it can be imaged or audio, that are said to affect the human psyche, and sometimes even kill them. Oh, that sounds like bullshit to you? Well, that's because it is, but let me finish. These urban legends, if you can even call them that, find their origin in, well, Russia, of course. This phenomenon had a Wikipedia article at one point exclusive to the Russian language Wikipedia. Of course, it was deleted shortly after it was created, probably because it's stupid, but through the Wayback Machine we can find that, yeah, it existed before and barely had shit to say. If you want some real knowledge on Russian death files, then look no further than this fandom wiki and, god, I should make a video about how hard the site has fallen off. It's things that are said to be in the Russian Death Files consist of a lot of things you've probably heard of before, including some that I've actually covered already. You know, Mariana Mortegard Glesgorv, Biznagium, WP Kep KW, the Wyoming Incident, Mr. Mix, and even The Grifter. This whole wiki is kind of laid out like the SCP wiki if you got it from the bargain bin. 
No, wait, that would be the backrooms wiki. Let me correct myself. This wiki is laid out if you got the SCP wiki from a landfill. Most pages in the wiki are, for the most part, copy-pasted or paraphrased from whatever the original creepypasta was, translated to Russian, obviously. They'll then list the effects of what will happen if you watch the death file, and sometimes they'll even give a class. Oh, wow, this one belongs to the third class. That means it's really, really scary. I don't know about you, but trying to tie all the creepy internet videos into one connected lore is a bit of a stupid idea, but it's also kind of funny. I love bad creepypastas more than anything else. What the fuck? Deer Man or Deer 2? I've never seen an iceberg entry that gives me a choice on what to cover. Well, let's go over the two options. Deer Man, from what I can gather, is a video by Markiplier with over 2 million views, where he plays a game where you run away from a giant deer guy. Probably not the video this iceberg is referring to. Rather, Deer 2 is probably the right one. I feel like Northfur's influence will never truly escape us on our descent down the iceberg. In this video, a person dressed as a naked, uncanny valley anthropomorphic deer makes various poses for the camera in complete silence. I kinda love this video, just because the poses he does are so ridiculous. Doing a little digging, I can find that this video originates from a channel called Circus Performers, and the original title is Humanimal Present the Deer, www.circusperformers.com. On their channel, they also have similar videos to this, such as a Dalmatian, a Snow Tiger, and a Zebra. Something I always wanted to know is, like, why are these so prevalent? Especially during the late 2000s and early 2010s. Like, everyone knows it's nightmare fuel, right? Like, no one actually thinks this doesn't give people nightmares, right? That's what you'd think, but they made a whole movie that looks like this. I think people give fursuits a lot of shit for being scary looking, which is pretty justified, but I'd much prefer looking at that to this. S.H. Festningen, or in English, The Fortress, is a now-deleted video uploaded sometime in 2012 by a Norwegian YouTuber called Onkelsoft. It features a man walking through a peaceful little Norwegian town, with the calming sound of the ocean playing in the background. It's a very nice video, at least that is until about 25 seconds in, when the footage cuts to several completely naked people lying on the ground and dancing. I'm assuming the reason it got taken down is because of the, you know, naked people, but the channel actually has a handful of videos that are still up that follow pretty much the exact same format. When I first saw these videos, I thought they were just some weird Norwegian ripoff of the Harlem Shake, but they actually predate that by a year. So, uh, get owned or, or something. Where the hell do I even begin? This entry is somewhat of an extension of the evil Barney and evil Elmo entry from Jesus fucking Christ 14 parts ago. These videos are utterly bizarre and consist of pretty much the same premise every single time. Someone's browsing the internet or playing a game or otherwise using their computer when a Barney the Dinosaur themed error message comes up. The error message will say that someone strapped a bomb to Barney the Dinosaur that will go off in some ridiculous amount of time, like 2,000 hours or something. It tells the protagonist to not shut their computer off or else the virus will destroy their computer. In every single one of these videos, they'll always be like, bro, fuck that, and hit the power button anyways. They turn their computer back on and the error message is still there and the time has been cut in half. This happens multiple times for the duration of the video. A voice, which sounds a lot like Barney, sounds increasingly more pissed at the user for closing out of the error message. Please don't you again. Really? Fourth time already? Now you're getting me irritated. If you keep it up, hey! What? Did you just turn off your computer six times? That's it. Now timer cuts are cut into three-fourths. Oh my freaking god, you just turned off your computer immediately when you turned on your computer. Which doesn't really make sense, because like, why would he get pissed if a bomb is strapped to him anyways? These will often have Barney turning evil or scary or hyper-realistic as the video progresses, finally ending in a jump scare, and apparently the computer being destroyed. I am officially now in evil mode for the rest of the era. You only have 30 chances left. Don't waste them now. This is my fourth evil mode. By the way, I changed my voice because I was too mad to use my Kuru voice. Just look what you've done. I'm now in fire evil terror mode. You are running out of chances. Best what?
You wasted 4 out of 5 chances of Barney's error. Wow, 450 chances. What a record. Well you know what, Purple Louie. I don't even care. You're just this stupid monster drawn from Microsoft Paint by Andrew Silverman 1. You are extremely grounded for 5363901637251256 these videos are often made by GoAnimate users and usually use some rudimentary way of editing videos like PowerPoint or even GoAnimate itself. Which, to be fair, what they're actually based on is kind of terrifying. Ransomware, such as the famous Annabelle virus, locks away all the files in your PC behind an encryption, and then a message pops up on your computer telling you they'll unlock your files if you pay them. It's even complete with the timer counting down and is even written in Comic Sans. That's most likely where the Barney era community got the idea. One question though, why is it always fucking Barney? Like, do they think Barney is scary or do they just think the idea of Barney blowing up is funny? Every single one of these videos follows the exact same formula. Sometimes they switch up the characters, other times they tell you to input a code, but the general idea is still there. And these videos are, much like the logo effects videos, very, very popular with Barney error 50 and ultimate Barney error having over a million views. A fucking million. Oh yeah, and I guess I should probably also mention the other thing this iceberg mentions, of Barney OS videos, which are a whole separate thing. These videos revolve around not only an error, but a whole operating system dedicated to Barney that the narcissistic purple fuck installs in your computer. These videos are even more perplexing and elaborate. Like, look at this one. Why does it give you the option between America, three Arabic countries, and the program formerly known as GoAnimate? I feel like I'm losing my mind by watching these videos. Like, everything I said in the past couple of minutes would make absolutely no sense to, like, 99% of the Earth's population. I don't even know how to end this entry. Uh, bye. Peekaboo Teddy Rips Face Off is a video of a peekaboo teddy bear ripping his face off. This video was posted in 2015 by Twohead666, who seems to be the creator of the bear. And this is him, you know, showing him off, with two other videos existing on the channel of the same concept, but clearly visually different. Like, he just did the same thing three times. Like, come on, dude, get some, get some more material. Besides that, not really a whole lot more to say about this. Just a silly video. The Yemeni couple drowning video is sadly exactly what it says on the tin. This video is very low quality, but it's pretty easy to make out what's going on. On April 12th, 2013, a young newlywed couple were going for a swim in Yemen to celebrate their marriage. Some sources say it was a dam, others say it was a lake, so I'm not entirely sure. However, when they got there, they noticed one fatal flaw in their plan. Neither of them knew how to swim. Or at least the husband didn't. Why would they decide to go to a large body of water for their honeymoon is beyond me, and it would even appear that they are right at the edge of a large underwater drop-off, just, you know, kind of walking around on the water floor. At one point, the man drops off the underwater ledge and begins sinking and flailing around, trying his absolute hardest to resurface. His wife goes down there to save him, however, usually when someone tries to save someone from drowning, the person's brain will force them to grab onto anything that could possibly help them resurface. In a desperate bid, he grabs onto his wife's legs, which causes her to sink too, probably helped in no small part by the full dress and hijab she's wearing. Then at one point, the video just goes silent and you can no longer see them, and there's just still water for the next two and a half minutes. This video really fucks with me, to be honest. I think there are... Very few ways of dying that are more horrific than drowning, and the way the last third of the video is basically completely silent besides like wind and other background noises is honestly haunting. Gee, I, I sure do hope the next entry after this one doesn't have some stupid name that completely ruins the mood of this entry. Right, uh, Bingo the Clowno. This one is an early computer animation released in 1998, directed by Chris Landreth, and later uploaded to YouTube by user Sam Press. This was uploaded all the way back in the tail end of 2005, the very first year YouTube existed. The video starts off with his live action segment, which seems to be some kind of theater performance of a man sitting on a chair when a clown walks up to him saying, Hi, Bingo the Clowno, over and over again. While the man pleads that he's not the bingo he's looking for. All this seems to do is make the clown's voice get louder and louder. It then takes us to the animated segment where a man is sitting on a chair in an empty black void and clowns keep walking up to him, calling him bingo, and then getting angry when he denies ever being Bingo the Clowno. It eventually ends with the man accepting his fate, saying that, yeah, maybe he is Bingo the Clowno. 
and then it ends. I believe the live action segment was the play Disregard This Play by the Neo Futurists, as the credits claim that's what inspired the short. It also credits the company Landreth worked at during the creation of the film, Alias Wavefront, a software company that's known for the creation of Maya, which is now one of the world's most used 3D graphics softwares. This video was actually created as a test of the software's capabilities, making it one of its first uses ever. I'm not sure why this of all things was one of its first tests, but hey, it made for a pretty memorable video. Swiggity Swag is a now-deleted video apparently posted in 2012 by a YouTube user named Aussie Jordan, or Undead Anime Lover, or Kami of Barrels. I don't think anyone really wants to own up to being the creator of this. It features this 3D animated orange creature character walking through this city background to the tune of a song that I cannot say the name of. The song is basically just the same like 15 words repeated over and over again, consisting almost entirely of racial slurs and stereotypes that, again, I can't repeat or even show you. Every video that uses this song seems to get taken down by YouTube staff for violating policies on hate speech and stuff like that, quite similarly to the Moon Man stuff from a few parts back. This song's lyrics are somehow even less creative than the average Moon Man songs, though. Kitty Cat Morph is a channel that's been around since 2006. Every single one of their videos are re-uploads of movie or TV show scenes where women get transformed into various animals. There's also some videos where they literally just take a stock image of a woman and fade it into an image of an animal while cracking and moaning sounds play. It seems like a pretty hyper-specific thing to do, but most of you will probably recognize this as fetish content. Transformation is definitely a thing people are into, and this guy has put it upon himself to chronicle all the time it's happened to women in TV and movies. This kind of channel is very common, and you can probably find a couple for, like, every fetish known to man. Like, here's all the time someone's gotten eaten in a TV show, or here's all the time someone's gotten inflated. They never explicitly say it's for a fetish thing, but, like, come the fuck on, you know what they're about. Proud Nothing is an animation channel that basically just does weird 2D animations, not really much else to it. I'm not exactly huge on their art style, but their animations are very absurdist and definitely makes sense being this low. Like, what the hell is even going on here? What, what drives someone to create this? Uh, that's true for pretty much all their videos besides their Bill Burr Monday Morning Podcast animated series where they animate clips from Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast. Moving on. Blood Over Intent is a satanic blood cult slash religion that exists on YouTube. No, it's not an ARG or art project or anything like that. This is, honest to God, actually a satanic cult on the site. However, while that's technically not an exaggeration, it does make them sound a lot more cool or badass than they actually are. Let's run it back to the beginning. In early 2020, Redditor Grog2002 posted to the r slash internet mystery subreddit, inquiring about a weird cult on YouTube where people record audio and play it backwards and try to decipher speech from it. The two channels they initially discuss are Zeus13 Ilza 13U13 and a suspended account. Zeus's videos consist of well, a lot of things. Their first video, titled Blood Over Intent, features him writing on a piece of paper, Blood Over Intent, I intend to bring forth heaven on earth. This is not the only video of his like this, as he has tons of others where he does the exact same thing. There's also a lot more videos of his where he showcases his esoteric beliefs. There's the obvious earth being flat, can't go wrong with that one, along with some form of magical power or protection being connected to speaking backwards into a camera, dragons being real, and something to do with drinking menstrual blood. I mean, he's a pussy vampire. Like, shit, that's, that's what he is. That's what he says he is. Noticeably, a lot of comments on these videos seem to be by the same people over and over again, and they always have repetitive phrases, such as blood thick and calling each other blood brothers. Doing some digging, the phrase blood over intent exists all around YouTube with many people doing the exact bleeding on paper thing that Zeus did in his first video. However big you assume this cult is, it's 
probably bigger, with countless accounts on YouTube of people performing the ritual. Like, just look up Blood Over Intent on YouTube search and sort by upload date. According to the Gizmodo article that exists about the topic, people practice this ritual in order to develop spiritual powers that allow them to change their perception in order to see past the false reality in which all of us are imprisoned. According to the ideals of the cults, people need to witness you performing this act in order for it to work. While you could just gather up a couple people and have them watch, the cult isn't exactly organized enough for that to work. Almost everyone simply just uploads it to YouTube. And when more people see it, the more inspired they are to do it themselves, and the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. Most people who are practitioners are so far deep into conspiracy theories that they usually have similar beliefs to that Zeus guy. Well, besides the period blood vampirism. I think that's just a fetish. I was mostly talking about the flat earth stuff, you know, the normal stuff. Relatively. Blood Over Intent was not founded by him, however, and was instead founded by a guy called Mark Braun, sometimes known online as Quasi Luminous, who's definitely a character. He's a plumber who lives in Coral Springs, Florida, and he claims he's the human manifestation of Satan. He was the first one to ever do the Blood Over Intent ritual on Christmas Eve 2013, and from then it spread across YouTube, with all the practitioners also proclaiming this plumber from Florida to be the direct manifestation of Satan himself. His videos, which are now almost completely deleted, sound like drug-induced ramblings, and he is possibly schizophrenic. He says that God is filling a list of 144,000 people to get into heaven, and to secure yourself a slot on that list, you need to perform the ritual. If you try to leave the cult, only suffering in the deepest pits of hell will await you. I couldn't really find what's going on with them nowadays. They still pop up from here and there, and Zeus definitely still uploads, but a lot of them have been run off YouTube, including Mark Quasi Luminous Braun himself. If you want more info on this topic, there are tons of Reddit threads, the Gizmodo article I mentioned earlier, and two videos by Nick Crowley and Blame It On Jorge, respectively. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I guess these should be talked about at some point, huh? Remember back a couple parts ago when I said live leak and other shock slash gore sites like it are more important than people give them credit for, as you could find footage of political events that would be censored pretty much anywhere else on the internet. While that's still true, as YouTube does delete them, for a while these videos were surfacing for longer than they probably should have. For a little background, starting in 2014, the extremist terrorist group, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, also known as ISIS, wanted to spread their influence beyond the Middle East. Given that we're living in the information age and all that, social media seemed like the pretty obvious pick. Hundreds of members of the group began making accounts on various platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. These videos would depict members executing various political enemies such as foreign soldiers, western soldiers, native civilians, and pretty much anyone else the group deemed as enemies. Many of the people killed in these videos were being used as hostages, with the group threatening to do so if governments such as the United States refused to cease operations in the Middle East. The group's preferred method of execution was famously beheadings, and you could see countless videos of people getting their head chopped off by ISIS members in a disturbing amount of places on the internet. Most of these videos were carried out by a certain Mohammed Mwazi, who was notable for having a British accent, as apparently that's where he grew up before joining ISIS. It was for this reason that the media would give him the nickname J J Jihad John. I'm, I'm not making that up. Apparently, he was even a member of an ISIS terrorist cell consisting of himself and three other members who also had British accents. They were given the name The Beatles. Again, I, I swear this isn't some dumb joke, it's right there. I think the craziest part about all of this is that I thought most of the people posting these videos to social media were like trolls or someone otherwise uninvolved in the conflict, but no, they were actual ISIS members uploading videos to YouTube. And it wouldn't only be beheadings too, sometimes they posted propaganda videos talking up the wonders of joining the group, which is probably what roped in people like Era Dixie, the COD player I talked about a few parts ago. And these would not get taken down as fast as they should have, as is the case with a lot of similarly shitty things uploaded to the site. You'd be hard pressed to find any more videos by ISIS members on YouTube nowadays though, as not only has YouTube's content moderation algorithms got more strict, some might say too strict, but also ISIS isn't nearly as powerful as it once was, though they definitely are still around. You Don't Know You Know You Know You Don't is a channel I've actually already talked about. It's the alternate account of Anna Matskovich, also known as Refbatch. You know, the Russian lady who was formerly a professional dancer before allegedly getting brainwashed into schizophrenia by the 
Russian government for her participation in anti-war protests. This new channel of hers is basically the same thing as the old one, just with a different name and not, you know, taken down. She still uploads quite frequently, as fate would have it, with her most recent video as of writing this script being 11 minutes ago. Yeah, something tells me she uploads every waking moment of her life to the internet, which is never a good sign. I mean, as if every other sign with this woman wasn't worrying. Nicholas Sonderegger was a YouTuber with around 2,000 subscribers on Sunspike, a channel he had since 2009. The videos on this channel would mostly consist of music and promotional videos for local rave bands. He was very involved in his local rave scene, and most of his content reflected that. He was also really good at dancing. Fuck yeah. Nicholas was living in San Diego, California, but after suffering from financial troubles, he and his roommate moved out to Salton City, a census designated them place in California that surrounds a large body of water, the Salton Sea. This town is frickin' weird. It was originally built in the 1960s and was planned to be a large resort area with sprawling roads, water, and sewer systems. However, since it was in the middle of fucking nowhere, being two and a half hours east from the nearest city, it has become a rare example of a modern day ghost town. Especially since they only got so far as to plot out and pave the roads. So you look on Google Maps, like, oh wow, there's a ton of road here, this must be a pretty nice to- Oh. Even still, the population has skyrocketed in the 21st century for whatever reason. In 2000, it was a little under 1,000, and 20 years later, the population was over 5,000. People began moving here because the housing got too expensive in San Diego. Nick and his roommate Austin was a part of this movement, and they moved to the suburb of the town, Salton Sea Beach. Yeah, a ghost town with fucking suburbs, which manages to be even more podunk than the city itself. It was here that they would be featured on Explore With Us, a father and daughter ran multi-million subscriber channel that specialized in true crime and urban exploration. The two took the channel on a tour of the creepy and eerie town, and it resulted in both a friendship and a popular source of content for the channel, as the area really resonated with the Explore With Us fanbase. Fast forward two months later, and something bad has happened to Nick. According to Austin, on September 7th, 2018, they both awoke late into the night to the sound of a woman screaming. They debated on whether or not to go investigate, and eventually decided on ignoring it and going back to sleep. Austin then fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning, Nick was nowhere to be seen. Personal items belonging to Nick, such as a knife sheath and various articles of clothing, could be found all along the Salton Beach area, but he himself was nowhere to be seen. Authorities were contacted, but they didn't really do much to help. They put out a bounty for $10,000 to anyone who had information about his whereabouts, and that's pretty much it. No search teams, and according to the Explore With Us team, no real action taken by the Imperial County Sheriff's Office. Just a simple, like, hey guys, hit us up if you see him. They didn't even spell his fucking name right. It probably has something to do with the fact that the Salton Beach area isn't super heavily governed. You know, like, to them, People just probably disappear in this area all the time, and it isn't worth the trouble to go looking for every single one. Which, obviously, is a horrible thing to say, but that's just kind of how it is in such a remote town in the county that also has to worry about places with, you know, actual people living in them. Only difference with Nicholas is that he was on a YouTube channel with 4 million subscribers. If he had never had that run-in with the Explorer Thus team, who's to say anyone would have known about this case? To this day, it's been... Jesus Christ, six years, and Nicholas's whereabouts are still completely unknown. The case is the subject of a lot of theories. Some, including Austin, believe Nicholas might have fled to Slab City, an off-the-grid community on the other side of the Salton Sea that has a reputation for being nearly completely lawless and inhabited by all kinds of people, like anarchists and vagabonds and outcasts and, um... Crackheads. It's definitely the kind of place that would fit nicely with Nick's lifestyle, but still, him leaving without telling anyone in the middle of the night is still weird as all hell. Some think Nick was murdered, most likely by someone using a woman screaming to bait him into a vulnerable position. Some even go as far to claim that the culprit was Austin. He's the only person known to have spoken to Nick before he disappeared, and it's entirely possible that he could be an unreliable narrator. He even seemed very shifty and aggressive toward the Explore With Us team when they came back to help investigate, though he did claim it was because he didn't like that the video was sponsored. Whatever the case, Nicholas Sonderegger's whereabouts have never been discovered, and we still don't know what happened that night. And unfortunately, it's likely we never will. 
Heather Mack is a woman from Chicago who had a very long history of domestic abuse conducted on her mother. This is a pretty long-winded story, so I'll try to keep it brief. In 2006, Heather's father died from an illness in a hotel room, and she believed that her mother was responsible. It was for this reason that she conducted a lot of domestic abuse against her mother that eventually culminated in 2014 when she was on a vacation in Indonesia. They were in a luxury resort, and Heather stole her mother's credit card and gave it to her boyfriend so that they could conduct a plot to murder her, which they did eventually do. Her remains were found in a suitcase in the trunk of a taxi cab, which earned her the nickname the Suitcase Killer. How this all relates to YouTube is that Heather actually confessed to her crimes on her YouTube channel. Yeah, she had a channel, and the confession was the only three videos uploaded to it. In the series of videos, she explained why she did it and all that, and soon after, she was arrested in Indonesia. She was then released from jail a few years later in 2021, and deported back to the United States, where she was arrested again in 2023. The Malfris Cameron Village Sewer Blob has a bit of a backstory. The story of this one goes that the Malfris Construction was a company that was hired by the city of Raleigh, North Carolina to investigate a sewer system underneath Cameron Village, one of the many communities of the city. So what they did is they grabbed a robot, put a surveillance camera on it, and drove it down into the sewers. And what footage did the camera come back with? Well, take a look. What the fuck is that thing? There's just this weird uh, pulsating mass crawling through the sewers of Raleigh. This video pretty understandably freaked out a lot of people when it came out in 2009, and no one really knew what it was until city officials confirmed it was a big-ass colony of tubefex worms, which I've never heard of, but yeah, sometimes I'll just cuddle up and assume this gurgling blob form. Ain't that just the cutest thing? Uh, Damn it, Boy is another channel I've already talked about. This is the account held by Pedro Ruiz III, who I talked about in Tier 5 because of the gun video where he told his girlfriend to shoot him and protected himself with a small book. I'm not sure why this or Ref Batch's alternate channel are here when they're just alternate accounts of people who were already mentioned three tiers prior. Maybe, maybe Pot of Plant just forgot. I don't know. I don't blame him. There are like 1,500 entries. Documentation clip of the animal, vegetable, mineralness of everything by Ken Feingold is, uh, th this. Are we thoroughly determined by the forces of nature? Aha. Uh -huh. I see what you mean, in a way. Good question. Is it an animal? It's obviously an art exhibit. The heads are meant to look like the artist himself. According to the description, each possesses the mind of an animal, vegetable, and mineral, and they debate the nature of violence with each other. The dialogue is completely computer generated, which is probably the most interesting thing about all this. Like 2004, and they were already making AI generated conversations, pretty advanced stuff. Besides that, there's not a super huge amount of stuff going on here. Slaughter Me Street is the name of an indie mascot horror game, but before that it was this channel, which is now called Odd Stories YT, which is honestly a better name since Slaughter Me Street was a play on Sesame Street that sounds really dumb. Anyways, this channel hosts a horror web series featuring these weird animatronic things. It has a pretty unique style and is something I haven't really seen before on YouTube. Uh, this channel's lore would be developed into the game 123 Slaughter Me Street as they were done by the same person. And the channel is still active, and now they're a VTuber, I guess. Is this considered a VTuber? Who knows at this point. Robbie Ganyernga is another channel that I thought was in some foreign language and that I would look really stupid when I pronounced it, and there would be indisputably someone who speaks the language in my comment section to correct me or make fun of me because of how terribly I pronounced it. However, this is not the case with this one, since this channel is literally just Angry Neighbor backwards, so there's not actually a correct way to pronounce it. Boom! Anyways, Robbie Ganyernga's channel has one purpose and one purpose only to document and expose how annoying, loud, rude, and noisy their neighbors are. All of their videos are black screens with simple audio recordings of their neighbors supposedly being disruptive. However, many have pointed out the fact that they don't sound like bad neighbors at all, and instead just sound like maybe a family having a conversation on the porch or something. Like, if they were actually being egregiously loud and refusing to keep it down, this channel would be somewhat justified because it would be evidence that they could feasibly submit to the cops or landlord or what have you for a proper noise complaint. 
But no, this is what most of their videos sound like. And how many videos do you guys think this channel has? Maybe 20, 50, 100? No, I'm not, I'm not fooling anyone. You already know the answer by now. 7,000 uploads to this channel, and every single one is almost exactly the same. Uh, this one has a baby meme on it, though, so I guess that's different. Yeah, a little bit overboard for a fucking noise complaint, huh? It's pretty clear that whoever runs this channel is delusional. In some of these videos, you can hear footsteps at the start and end of the audio, possibly implying that they're running into their property or implanting an audio recording device and running out so as to not get caught. In other videos, you don't hear the neighbors at all, possibly implying that Mr. or Mrs. Yernga is having auditory hallucinations. At that point, you gotta worry for the neighbor's safety, especially given the vitriolic titles these videos have. And it absolutely does not help that the channel's profile picture is two pistols. Yeah, that's a red flag if I've ever seen one. This channel has not uploaded a single video in six years, with their final video, Loud, Rude, Annoying, Noisy, Neighbors, Asshole, being uploaded in July 2017. This would be the part where I connect the channel to a real-life case of someone getting arrested for stalking, or possibly doing something even further than that, but I can't, because that's all we know about this channel. No clue why they stopped uploading, but I hope it's not because they did what their profile picture would imply. Vance Stone was the internet alias of William Edward Acheson, and he had a now-deleted YouTube channel with around 3,000 subscribers. His style of content was kind of strange to say the least, and he was another one of those guys with a strange amount of interest in mass killings, such as Columbine and Virginia Tech. In fact, his content would partially consist of recreations of these events in games such as Blockland, which is that game where you build stuff, apparently. He also made shit posts about the events, such as the Bill Nye theme transitioning into 9-11 footage. It's pretty clear he was a fucking edgelord, but it didn't only stop at YouTube. He would frequent sites like 4chan, Kiwi Farms, The Daily Stormer, and was even a system operator for Encyclopedia Dramatica for a bit, a pretty rancid site he joined at the young age of 11 years old. In real life, William was a complete and utter loser. He lived in the tiny rural town of Aztec, New Mexico, which is in the middle of the desert. In high school, every single day his outfit would include a trench coat and he even got suspended at one point for using a whiteboard to write up a series of events of Columbine. After his suspension, he straight up never came back to school, cementing himself as a high school dropout and establishing hatred within himself for the school. Online, he was friends with David Sonbali, a fellow white supremacist who would later commit the Munich mass shooting of 2016. Later that same year, William was investigated by the FBI. Though he had no previous criminal record, he made a concerning series of posts where he implied he was interested in purchasing weapons for a shooting, most likely at his former high school. Specifically, he asked for weapons that are good for killing a lot of people within a budget. However, he successfully convinced the FBI agents that he had no plans to do anything, telling them it was just satire and trolling, and that he wasn't actually the type to do any of this stuff. The FBI basically fucked off once they found out he only owned an airsoft gun. However, this was the biggest mistake they could have made. In late 2017, he published a video to one of his alternative accounts explaining his frustration that his channel was decreasing in viewership, and a lot of his most popular videos were being wiped off the site due to a change in YouTube guidelines. Later that very same day, William would go to his former high school with a firearm and, disguised as a student, open fire on the school killing two students before taking his own life. It was quite the sad day in the small town of Aztec, New Mexico. Interestingly, soon after William's death, he got a page on the site he loved so dearly, Encyclopedia Dramatica, and they fucking ripped into him, making fun of everything about him, from being a lonely incel who lives in the middle of nowhere, to calling him a sexless, fedora-tipping brony-slash-furry who shitposted on pole, telling him he wasted his money on a gun that costed half a grand when he could have spent it on a prostitute to lose his virginity, to even making fun of the fact that he got barricaded out of an unlocked room by a couch. Encyclopedia Dramatica even gave his shooting an F-. Yes, they have a scoring system for mass killings, it's super edgy and stupid. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that he did all of this, and the very community he was a part of just laughs at him posthumously. Sucks to fucking suck, I guess. I don't have any sympathy for him, obviously. He, he killed people.
This is an entry that's a little hard to research for, as it's a channel that's been taken down by YouTube staff's hands with little archive, so you'll have to bear with me for this one. Ian McGuire, better known online by his YouTube handle, Hate the State, is a man from Port Charlotte, Florida. On his YouTube channel, he would mainly upload videos of him grabbing a camera and filming random people, oftentimes without saying a word. These would range from pretty much everyone, to random people on the street, to police officers, and even NBC News' camera crew. Without fail, they always tell him to fuck off, and he either makes up some excuse about how he's protected under the First Amendment, or he just doesn't say anything and continues filming. Nobody in this somewhat small town seems to like this dude. Apparently, Ian considers himself to be a First Amendment auditor. For those who don't know, because clearly Ian doesn't, an auditor is a person hired to inspect a company and make sure they're doing things up to standard and stuff like that. Except the fatal flaw in that is that he was never hired, he's not part of an auditing organization, or is even qualified to do something like that, the people he does it to never ask for it, and sometimes just does it to random people on the street and not employees of a company or anything. Sometimes he even films people's children, which is obviously illegal. In 2019, he was charged with three felony charges based on harassment, which made those in his community extremely relieved. Apparently, he also, and this caught me off guard when I first read it, mailed a dead kitten to an elderly woman he was stalking, along with a sex toy and, um, poop? and made violent threats against her and her family, including 898 threats of sexual assault against her grandchildren. Jesus, I, th I thought he was just weird and filmed people. I didn't know about that part. So yeah, maybe the filming thing was actually protected on the First Amendment, but that's definitely not. J Jesus Christ. Well, now he's behind bars, rotting away in some Florida prison. Thank God. Kathleen Daniel is another one of those accounts with weird 3D animations. With an account as old as 2006, she's been on YouTube for quite some time, pumping out these indecipherable animations. It looks like she uses something similar to what Casina777 and Uncle Tom used, however her videos are far more incomprehensible and almost dreamlike. The woman behind the account is apparently what this Reddit post calls a schizophrenic middle-aged black woman, which, judging from the rare videos where she shows her face, I'd say that's a pretty apt description. This video, called Connect the Dots, features her rambling incoherently about politics and conspiracy theories. I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, and because I don't want to hear it, let's condemn the messenger. Oh, Obama, oh, Obama brought that to our ears, no we don't want to hear it, we don't want to hear it, we don't want to hear it. Putting in context, this makes her content, to me, a lot more intriguing than a lot of these other 3D animators on the site. Like sure, something like Cool 3D World or, I don't know, Ben Wheel, giving random examples here, are pretty clearly made by someone who knows what they're doing is weird. Like, you know, these are videos made with the express purpose of being weird. However, Kathleen Daniel does it just because it makes sense to her. And to me, that's a hell of a lot more interesting than most other animation channels on this iceberg. Of course, that's not to discredit the horrors of schizophrenia, I'm just throwing my two cents in. In recent years, she seems to have vanished off the face of the internet. Her last video, which was a trailer for a feature-length film called Willie's Wife, was released back in 2017. This film actually did come out, and you can stream it online or buy it on DVD for $10. The domain for her former website, dareal.com, is still linked in her channel description. However, it seems to have been taken down by some home improvement company that writes a bunch of articles that seem to be AI generated, which, you know, awesome. I love how the internet just doesn't work anymore. Doing a bit more digging, I can find that on the site that hosts Willie's Wife, it was announced that Kathleen Daniel sadly passed away in 2022. She was quite old, being in her late 70s, but still definitely very sad nonetheless. Even worse is that I had to dig pretty far for this information. Like, I would have thought this would be information on a more uh, public form, but it seems not many know that she's no longer with us. And, I don't know, when I found out, it just kind of hit me, like, damn, that shit sucks. While her site has succumbed to the dead internet, her YouTube channel is still available, and all of her videos are still up, so, you know, at least that's nice. Gaga Styles was a popular YouTuber in the Serbian side of the internet. His real name was 
Holy shit, his name is Dragon. Now for this entry, this is a channel that no longer exists as it was taken down, and it's in a language I'm unfamiliar with, and English language information is pretty fucking scarce. So I'm heavily relying on Google Translate for this one, and I have a feeling Serbian isn't the language they go to first when refining their translation algorithms. No offense to any Serbian viewers, just how it is. So this is another one you'll have to cut me some slack for. However, I think I get the general gist of this one. Dragon's videos before his channel was taken down mainly consisted of vlogs and stuff like that. His videos were unhinged with some simply being vlogs, other times showing off his pet goat Milka and others being uh, whatever this is. His videos were often of a sexual nature, doing stuff like making tutorials on how to suck cock or how to eat pussy. Now, by day, Dragon apparently worked at a kindergarten. Now, judging from that, and also the fact that there's an NSFW tag on this entry, you might think you can formulate some ideas in your head of what's up with this dude, but trust me, you can't. In 2018, YouTube took his channel down, the cause of which being sexual misconduct. Ladies and gentlemen, to my knowledge, this guy is not a pedophile. However, he did allegedly do something along those lines. He fucked the goat. He fucked the- he's a goat fucker. He, go he fucked the goat. Now again, this might be Google Translate being annoying, or multiple people on Reddit just being liars. What I definitely know is that this guy was pretty popular in his country. So, Serbian viewers, I know you're out there, I, I see you in my analytics. Please tell me, did this guy actually fuck his goat? Like, ple please help me in the comment section. I, I know some countries have stereotypes like put against them that they like fucking goats and sheep and stuff, so it could be like a dumb joke, but this is also the YouTube iceberg and weirder shit has happened, so I don't know, anything's possible, so just please tell me, I, I really need to know. Tarzan Rubber Band is a two-minute video uploaded in 2006 where a guy with a star of David drawn on each nipple repeatedly says Tarzan Rubber Band while other random shit happens. Apparently, this video is not by the uploader, AO Gymnast 269 who seems to just be a high school girl uploading home videos in a high school news segment. The video was actually by Jew B and Milky White, a musical artist who's like this edgy parody artist kind of thing. They have songs about fucking dogs and infants, uh, AIDS, and Moon Man level racism. Tarzan Rubber Band might unironically be their best song. The news storyteller is a guy on YouTube who uploads primarily children's videos where he plays with a bunch of toys, mostly Thomas the Tank Engine and My Little Pony, and reads stories, sometimes dressing up in his Gumby costume. I don't think he's actually doing it for children, though, as his videos existed far before YouTube Kids, as he's been around since 2008. This channel sometimes gets put on creepiest YouTube channel lists, like the one done by Mr. Nightmare, because of the way the guy talks. As a harvest cookie on an author today, I want you to help us take it to market. Some people think that he talks like that because he has autism, which, no tiptoeing around it, he definitely does, but that's not the reason for his voice. It's pretty clear that he talks like that because of a stroke he had that permanently fucked up his tongue. This results in his videos being pretty hard to understand. Still though, he has a very impressive work ethic, with over 7,000 videos, which means he has more videos than subscribers. He uploads like, almost every day, and still uploads to this day. I've simply gotta respect it. The Sesame Street YouTube channel is one of the oldest forms of children's content on the site, as it dates all the way back to January 2006, far before the rise of Cocomelon and YouTube Kids and Elsagate and all those other buzzwords. It's hard to say whether or not this was a good thing or not, because while Sesame Street is certainly more fulfilling for a small child's brain than the content slob YouTube offers now, YouTube was also a lot more vulnerable in the late 2000s and early 2010s, as we've discussed previously with things like Operation YouTube, the May AIDS hack, and all the times me at the zoo has had a subscription hacked, and so on and so forth. And as fate would have it, on October 16th, 2011, the Sesame Street YouTube channel was victim to one of these hackings. 
all five years worth of content was wiped from the site at the perpetrator's hand and in its place was porn. So, so much porn. Who could have done this, you might ask? What sick fuck is responsible for showing adult content to kids? Well, the channel had its description changed to this. Who doesn't love porn, kids? Right, everyone loves it. I'm Mr. Ed XWX, and my partner, Mr. Suicider91, are here to bring you many nice content. Please don't let Sesame Street to get this account back, kids. Please, let me and Mr. Suicider91 have it, and we gonna make all the America happy. Alongside this, the profile picture was changed to that of the person that description mentions, Mr. Ed XWX. So, mystery solved, right? It's Mr. Ed XWX. Lock that dude up and we can all go home. Well, on the same day of the hack, Mr. Ed uploaded this video called I Did Not Hack Sesame Street. This video is a still image that reads, I did not hack Sesame Street. I am an oncest YouTuber. I work hard to make quality gameplay videos. And most important, I respect the community guidelines. People were mixed about this. Some people didn't buy it and figured he wasn't being as oncest as he let on. However, a lot more thought he was telling the truth. Perhaps he was framed by someone who just didn't like him. I mean, why would he publicly out himself as the culprit? It just kind of seems fishy. Wavy WebSurf did a video about this debacle, and he actually managed to contact Mr. Ed, since he seems to still be active on the internet. In those emails, he said that neither YouTube nor the Sesame Street copyright holders took any form of action against him, perhaps knowing intuitively that he wasn't responsible, most likely drawing the same conclusion that a lot of others did. He still doesn't know who was actually responsible, and also has no idea who Mr. Suicider91 is either. This remains today as an internet mystery gone unsolved. We probably will never know who was actually responsible, and the whole incident seems to have been forgotten in the annals of internet history. However, it was probably one of the major reasons why people demanded safer spaces for children on YouTube, and by extension caused, in part, the birth of YouTube kids, and all the shit shows that have resulted from that. So, uh, fuck you, Sesame Street hacker. May AIDS was way cooler than you. Metalosis Maligna, An Extraordinary Disease is a 7-minute horror short film directed by Floris Kayak, also known for Oscar the Modular Body, that disguises itself as a realistic medical documentary about the eponymous disease. The basic idea is that Metalosis Maligna is a disease that affects patients who have been fitted with medical implants. These implants slowly make metal grow more than intended, taking over the patient's body and they turn into these bizarre mechanical looking constructions more than humans. It looks really freaky, and the effects are pretty well done for the time period. It managed to fool a lot of people, as obviously the premise is a bit silly and unrealistic. The way it's presented makes it seem a lot more feasible. Also, it was 2006, and there was no professional-looking content on YouTube, so people believed anything. I mean, just look at Infinite Solutions. Also, the plot of this is literally just Tetsuo the Iron Man. I mean, and I guess the Akira character, too, to a lesser extent. If your house was infested with mice or rats or any other kind of rodent, what would you do to stop it? If you weren't trying to hire an exterminator, you might purchase a classic mouse trap. You know, the ones that you put some bait on and when a mouse goes to eat it, it clamps around their neck. That's what you do if you're normal. However, some people on YouTube take it a few steps further. There are these videos, often reaching millions of views, that feature mouse traps that are supposed to be more effective than the classic design. You know, it is kind of flawed, and it doesn't always kill the mice, so I get it. But some of these are, are, are just brutal, like a little mousy electric chair. Other times, they go even further than that. Sometimes they'll make the mouse fall into pools of water that they then electrocute. Sometimes they'll force the mouse onto electric panels that slowly zaps them to death. And in a lot of these, you can hear the mouse's desperate squeaks as they try to escape. Like, I get it. Electric mouse traps are probably a lot more successful at dealing with these things. But for Christ's sake, you don't need to make a saw trap for them. These videos are also usually met with comments similar to those you'd see on the monkey abuse videos. Actually, that's a pretty good tie-in. For the monkey abuse videos, people often defend them by saying that in certain countries, monkeys are considered pests, not unlike rats or mice. And that apparently justifies making animal abuse videos towards them and commenting that you want to torture and kill them. But I feel like even doing it to mice is fucked up. Like, there are surely more ethical ways of killing them, right? 
I don't know, maybe I sound like a, a friggin' liberal right now, but that's how I see it. Okay, you can tell this chart's a bit outdated when a video by Gooseworks is in tier 8. The Blue Channel and the Blue Channel Thalassin are two videos uploaded in 2018 and 2021 respectively. The first video is literally just a color blue with a song playing that people seem to think is terrifying, and the other is a mock advertisement for a fictional antidepressant called Thalassin that may have side effects of giving you new emotions. And then all the emotions are these weird faces. Pretty simple, but effective analog horror, but again, way too popular to be in tier 8. Like, I would think this is like tier 4 at the lowest. A Strange Creature on Webcam is a video uploaded in 2006, and might just be the perfect creepy YouTube video. It's 30 seconds long and features the dude sitting in front of a camera in his room, something that most people would be familiar with, as that's probably a pretty similar scene to where the average viewer would be watching the video. And there's like this weird gremlin creature in the doorway that just kind of scurries about. See, the video is so low quality that you really couldn't make out what it is, even if you tried your hardest. Then the guy's like, the fuck? And then that's it. There's no jump scare, and it doesn't even really get resolved. But like, I don't know, something about this video fills me with a warm sense of nostalgia. More so than like, any other video like it on this iceberg. Like, this is what make people shit themselves in prehistoric YouTube. Hell yeah, dude. And what better way to end off this part with the ever so mysterious and confusing Schnell Online. This is an entry that parallels are being drawn in my mind to World Corp Enterprises, which closed off the sixth tier. Both are mysterious pieces of media that no one can really agree on a solid explanation for, leaving me and others to pick up the pieces. Which sounds annoying, but both of them are actually really interesting, so you know, it's chill. Here's what rumors will tell you about Schnell Online, which just so happened to lay the discussion surrounding this game. Schnall Online is an MMO supposedly originating from the deep web, created by a man named Olven Wiplanis. There is no way to actually access or play this game, at least from the surface web, however, exactly one video's worth of gameplay footage exists on YouTube. Uh, roughly one, we'll get into that later. Through this gameplay footage, we can tell that the game is pretty damn surreal. Everything's in black and white, and the general look of the HUD alongside the tips that are mostly gibberish might remind some of Goblet Grotto, a game by the creator Space Funeral that is a whole different weird game that doesn't have a backstory, it's just weird. Parallels might also be drawn in your mind to a certain game called Worlds.com, or Worlds Online, which is an abandoned online game from the mid-1990s that was a precursor to things like Second Life and uh, the Metaverse, I guess. That has now, or at least was at one point, been taken over by a group of people who are supposedly a cult. Now, rumor has it that Schnell Online was used by all sorts of, uh, you know, malicious characters. Pedophiles, terrorists, murderers, bad guys, you know, just real, real ne'er-do-wells. This rumor, I believe, was started on 4chan. The first example of anyone talking about this game on X was on a certain thread created in 2016. One you might remember, as we talked about it in the last part. Yep, we're back to this iceberg again, and as I mentioned in the last part, Schnell Online is nestled cozily in the very bottom tier. Now, we've already been over the idea that the person who most likely made the chart was Saint Timmy, a YouTuber whose focus is on old, obscure, and weird games. Saint just so happens to be the person who uploaded the one bit of Schnell Online gameplay that exists. And if you go to his Twitter, you can find some weird shit in his likes, but also his display name is Olven Replanis, who, as I already mentioned, is supposed to be the creator of the game. Hell, the player character in the footage is even named Olven W. Now, is Olven Replanis Saint's real name or just a pseudonym? Well, that doesn't matter, but, but, what does matter is that it's pretty clear that they're the same person. Nexpo came to this conclusion on the game segment in his video, Mysteries in Online Video Games, and in this video he actually interviews Saint about the development process and player base of the game. And Saint mentions that the player base was small and he wasn't all too familiar with it. He then tells him to find some guy named Q, which in summary, Nexpo could not find. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there does exist other forms of gameplay footage online. This video by LucyLoudFan103, 
Don't love the pattern I'm recognizing there, but whatever. Was uploaded in 2021, shortly after Nexpo made his video on the subject. In this new gameplay footage, the game is running on a web browser window. The player is just kind of walking around, exploring the world of Schnell, and running into some random images of what I think are Toho characters and also, um... A Nazi flag. Notably, the user's desktop features a Kekistan My Little Pony wallpaper and has folders that are called shit like preteen, toddler, and 13 to 15 years old. Some users in the comment section seem quite concerned. Like, what's in those folders? Th that's not what I, th I think it is, right? To which I answer, probably not. It kind of just seems like some edgy humor meant to get a rise out of the audience and line up with the whole evil dark web game thing going on. Like, of course, the person with the deep web game on their hard drive would have some weird folders. I don't think they actually have CP, though. So, what does this all add up to? One thing's definitely for certain, and that's that Saint is a friggin' troll. You see, Saint was an active member of the aforementioned worlds.com, which had a small group that touted themselves as a cult that still hung around the servers, and occasionally fucked with visitors, as evidenced in Vinny Vinesauce's stream of the game. Saint really liked this whole deep web creepypasta game aesthetic, and concocted an idea for a game inspired by this vibe. The thing is though, unlike Worlds, Schnell Online was not online. In his vision for the game, the player experience would actually start from the moment you hear about it online. It would be at the bottom of every video game and conspiracy iceberg, and rumors would be spread among the internet that the game has dark criminal secrets, and you'd see sparse bits of gameplay footage with users talking to each other in strange, hard to decipher words. The rumors, of course, being spread by Saint himself. On some of these threads, users would be led to a game called Carcass, which is an RPG maker game that features hints and codes that would eventually lead to Schnell Online. Upon booting up Schnell, you'd be able to explore the worlds that the quote-unquote users had created, and would even be able to eavesdrop on their conversations. Thing is though, these players aren't real. Not only were the rumors that Schnell Online being infested with criminal activity fake, but also the idea that the game had any level of activity at all was fake. Schnell Online wasn't even online, the, the title was a lie. It's honestly a fucking genius idea for a game. You read the dialogue, which you ideally believe to be real people talking with each other, and it allows you to solve puzzles and passwords, taking you deeper down the rabbit hole. The further down you go, the more depraved the contents of the game would be. You'd find people talking about hiring hitmen, creating bombs, or exchanging otherwise illegal content. However, the game was never finished. It was probably way too ambitious for its own good, and now is simply remembered as another internet mystery, only remembered in that Nexpo video where Saint intentionally misleads him, because again, he's a, he's a troll. Like from where I see it, Saint literally just made shit up about his own game and told Nexpo to find some guy that possibly doesn't even exist. Oh, and it's also remembered in iceberg charts like this one or Wendigoons. Two of Wendigoons, actually. A fitting fate, as those are where the mystery started. Schnell Online is, in the truest sense of the word, an alternate reality game. And you know what? I think this one's pretty friggin' neat. And that's it for part two of tier eight of the massive YouTube iceberg. This video took way longer than I would have liked it to, so I hope it was worth the wait. I've been kind of getting worried about like whether or not these later tiers are getting boring to you guys, because while they are more and more exciting to research for, I can't exactly tell the result of my efforts. Uh, what do you guys think? So far, what's been your favorite tier? What do you enjoy hearing me talk about and what's boring? Because I know not every entry on the iceberg is a slam dunk, you know? Maybe you might actually enjoy hearing me talk about ARGs, I don't know. Speaking of which, Schnell Online is another example of an ARG that actually has had my interest for quite some time. You can probably tell why parallels are being drawn in my mind to World Corp, but with everyone believing rumors that they're both fronts for criminal activity and stuff, and also both are things that I've been hearing about for years but never actually got closure on until now. Anyways, moving on to Kofi donations, um, this person Scoob donated 50 fucking dollars since my last video, which is like crazy. Like ser seriously, thank you to- thank you to Scoob, like Jesus Christ. And all my other donators, but especially Scoob. I feel like this is around the time I should be starting a Patreon. If you guys would be interested in that, also let me know. I don't really know what I put on it, but yeah. 
Anyways, that about wraps everything up. Thank you guys for 8,000 subs, and I'll see you all next time when we wrap up Tier 8 of the massive YouTube iceberg. See ya.